distinguished guest, uh, John Bellamy Foster. Uh, but before that, let me very briefly introduce polenecology to those encountering it for the first time. Um, polenecology is a collective set out with a Marxist perspective to contribute to the development of Marxist ecological awareness, both in the ecological movement and in the socialist movement. Uh, we aim to promote international Marxist ecological literature and to develop partnerships with movements in other countries. In line with the needs of the struggle, we aim to develop new organizations and platforms and to create an ecological movement in which rural and urban toilers and the oppressed, and especially women and young people, become subjects and leaders. As Poland Ecology, we invite everyone to join our collective who considers that the ecological struggle should be part of the struggle for social liberation against capitalism and that it should be organized in a way that will spread to all of it and who want to be involved in the development and implementation of a new program and strategy in this direction. So let me very briefly also introduce our guest today, um, John Bellamy Foster, I'm sure you all know him, is a professor of sociology at the University of Oregon, and he is the editor of Monthly Review. He writes about a variety of topics, including political economy of capitalism, uh, the economic crisis, ecology, the ecological crisis, Marxist theory, and others. And he has published widely. Um, his books include the groundbreaking Marxist ecology um, in 2000, the ecological rift with Brett Clark and Richard York. Uh, more recently, the return of nature, which was also translated to Turkish. And very recently, um, his co-authored book with Brett Clark, Marx and the Earth, was translated and published as part of um, our own initiative, Polan Ecology book series. Uh, so, John, it's it's an honor to have you here today with us. Um, um, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. And let me start with our first question. So we have a set of questions. Uh, some rather theoretical, some more um, you know, practical and political, but uh, let's start with the theoretical ones. So you have made many foundational contributions to the eco-Marxist literature in the, in the past decades, and you and your co-authors work make up a significant portion of the um, contemporary eco-Marxist and eco-socialist literature. Can we start by first elaborating on the central concept of the metabolic rift? Um, especially in Marx, we see that the concept is based on the separation between town and country and capital, while today, of course, the depth and the scope of the rift has reached a planetary scale. So what does that imply for the very concept of metabolic rift? And uh, we know that at times you have produced ideas that challenge uh, some older approaches, for example, Neil Smith's uh, social nature, or some more recent approaches, uh, for example, um, you know, Jason Moore's approach in the web of life. Um, so what fundamentally distinguishes for you the metabolic rift theory from other Marxist, Marxist conceptualizations of nature? Well, um, let me give just a brief history. I mean, the after, uh, when the ecological movement first arose and it really arose in the 1950s, uh, led by scientists against uh, the um, thermonuclear testing above, you know, above ground thermonuclear testing at the time. And um, the, the ecological um, movement at that time was, was led by socialists, um, people like um, Barry Commoner, for example. And they were also... Uh, connected to to socialism, obviously to Marxism, and at that time, and uh, there there was a sense, you know, Shigeto Tsuru was another figure that Marxism and ecology fit together quite naturally, and there weren't really any theoretical debates about it at the time because it was sort of understood in Barry Commoner's uh, the closing circle. He even referred to to uh, Marx's discussion of the, the robbing of the earth and, and what we now call the metabolic rift. Uh, and um, so it was sort of taken for granted that Marxism and ecology fit together. But in the 1980s, when eco-socialism 
developed as a distinct tradition, it was responding very much to, to green theory uh, that was, uh, that was um, in, in many ways Malthusian, to deep ecology and so on. And uh, what, what happened was there um, was a kind of eclectic mixing of Marxism with green theory in which Marxists actually are socialists apologized for Marx's failure to deal with ecological issues, his, in, in Ted Benton's case, his failure in comparison to, to uh, Malthus to recognize ecological limits and so on. And so Marxists tended to, to take on green theory as it was developed at the time and mix it in an eclectic way with Marxism based on labor. And uh, the, um, the result was not very satisfactory, satisfactory in a theoretical sense. And uh, the one major figure in this was James O'Connor. And um, I was on, on the editorial board of Capitalism, Nature, Socialism, and we had lots of debates. Eventually, I, I just, you know, I decided, well, if we wanted to, to uh, understand this, we had to go back to the foundations of classical historical materialism and, um, and see what was there and understand how Marx approached such questions. And in the process, I, I realized that Marx's ecological critique, um, which we had already been aware of in some ways, was far more profound than we thought. And, and the way we understood this uh, is in terms of the metabolic rift, uh, the theory of metabolic rift, where Marx uh, looked at you know, building, especially on the work of Justice von Liebig, began to understand how the... Um, the removal of of um, of um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, basically the elemental co constituents of the soil, the soil nutrients and and other soil nutrients, uh, their removal in the form of, of food and fiber from the countryside to the cities, where they ended up polluting the cities and not returning to the soil. He understood this as, as what he called a, a irreparable rift in the in, interdependent process of social metabolism between humanity and nature, which was really the, the core of the, the um, metabolic rift idea. And the and, uh, more we studied Marx's analysis, the more we understood that this was integrated into his whole analysis. And in Marx's ecology, I not only I'd already written about the metabolic rift in 1999 in the theory of um, Marx's theory of metabolic rift in the American Journal of Sociology. And in Marx's ecology, I decided to try to understand how this came about in Marx's analysis. And I thought, well, this had to do with his materialism. And it went much deeper than simply uh, reading Liebig. And uh, so we had to go back to the beginning and I went back to Marx's confrontation with Epicurus and how he understood materialism. Because in Marxism, materialism had been reduced to simply economics. Uh, while Marx had a, a materialism that, that, um, that was consistent with um, or, or relied on the, the uh, natural scientific notion of the materials conception of nature. And he had rooted his own understanding of that from the beginning uh, in, in um, the development of materialism from, from um, ancient uh, uh, philosophy on to the present. So then we began to have a systematic picture of, of, of all of this. Now, metabolism, Marx introduced the notion of social metabolism, meaning the, the, how human beings relate to the external nature, or, or in his terms, the universal metabolism of nature. Uh, they do so through the social metabolism. We appropriate from nature and use, um, use that, and what we, we use returns to nature. But there's a whole metabolic process which 
for human beings is really um, our social metabolism is carried out through the labor and production process. So this created a systems theory, and it's very clear in Marx that um, that linked the ecology and the economy. And while we talk about the theory of metabolic rift, which is the ecological crisis aspect of that, it's really much bigger. It's it's actually a whole systems theory. Richard Levin's uh, the great Harvard ecologist and Marxist theorist said that, that Marx provided the first systems theory of a complex object, that is capitalism. And he did it in such a way that integrated ecology and, and, and economics. The word ecology was, was introduced by Heckel in 1866 and meant the economy of nature. Um, it, it was basically, uh, Darwin had used the term the economy of nature and Heckel introduced uh, ecology as a shorter term for that, but it wasn't picked up immediately. And uh, the the main ecological concept that was emerging and and Marx got this from Roland Daniels, his his friend Roland Daniels, not from Liebig, but um, his um, uh, Roland Daniels was was a communist who, who died early as a result of imprisonment. But Marx dedicated the poverty of philosophy for to him. He was uh, Daniels was a physician and scientist, and he wrote uh, this um, work called Microcosmos uh, that actually only had one reader prior to the 1980s. Um, his only the only person who read his book was Karl Marx because the book wasn't published. But Marx took up the concept of metabolism as a, a basis for systems analysis and integrating economy and ecology. And this is actually the way that that ecosystem analysis developed. In fact, Marx's friend, Ray Lancaster, who was also Darwin and, and uh, Huxley's protege, uh, was also involved in these discussions on nutrients cycling and and um, ecology and and he called it bio bio bionomics and uh, he um, uh, he was um, he read Marx's Capital was the leading uh, British uh, evolutionary theorist uh, Dar Darwinian thinker in in England in the generation after Darwin. And he wrote about ecological crisis due to capitalism. And his student, um, Tansley, who was also kind of a Fabian socialist, Arthur Tansley, uh, developed the ecosystem concept basically on the, um, you know, on the basis of metabolism. And this has taken us all the way forward. We now talk about the earth metabolism, the core, core concept of uh, Earth system theory is um, is um, the, the Earth metabolism, and when we un the um, the way science explains the anthropo anthropocene, or at least the current phase of the anthropocene, is in terms of what they call an anthropogenic rift in the biogeochemical cycles of the planet. Uh, the notion of biogeochemical cycles came from Soviet thought, but the 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 um, uh, the basic problem is is an anthropogenic rift in the biogeochemical cycles of the planet. In other words, the way we understand the Earth system crisis is directly related to uh, in in science in terms of natural science to the way Marx approached the issue. But Marx has the advantage um, over all other approaches uh, in, in that his, his analysis developed out of a critique of capitalism and captures both the social and ecological dimensions at the same time, which no other theory does. And uh, so all of the, you know, the other approach, approaches to ecological Marxism I don't actually usually call them ecological Marxism. They're very variations of eco-socialism, uh, but the, but I'm not sure they're all ecological Marxism. Uh, the the other approaches are generally eclectic, um, 
um, um, picking this or that and and uh, playing, uh, sometimes playing word games, um, uh, fighting over issues like dualism and uh, not really engaging with a systemic uh, problem and not actually engaging with Marx's theory directly or the development of, of um, the whole problem of, of the social metabolism. Basically, we have a problem of, of the contradiction between an alienated social metabolism produced by capitalism and the universal metabolism of nature, which we call the earth system. And this is where we are. And I think it's the more systematic, scientific in the broad sense approach that is, is fundamentally more useful. One other thing before I stop on, on this is that the metabolic rift theory in itself is not sufficient. I mean, it's, of course, it's part of the Marxist critique of political economy and, um, and uh, it's related to all of that. But, but I've come to the conclusion and my later work is on that. I have a new book coming out called The Dialectics of Ecology, but, but my work um, in The Return of Nature and in this new book and in other things it emphasizes that we can't really put this together without the um, dialectics of nature, uh, which was the second foundation of Marx's theory with which Engels is most directly uh, associated. Um, that's great and very interesting. I just finished reading Saito's new book, uh, Degrowth Communism, where it's very controversial about dialectics of uh, nature. But I want to go back to what you just said about um, the Anthropocene, right? Um, so you, um, you do agree that it is capitalism that generated the Anthropocene. Um, and still you have argued that substituting notions like capitalocene in the place of the Anthropocene it risks losing substantial scientific content and uh, critical insights that come along with the concept of Anthropocene. Instead, you argued that uh, we could see the Anthropocene concept as, as a prelude to a socio-ecological revolution. And instead of the Capitalocene concept, you have suggested the term um, Capitalinian, Capitalinian, I guess, uh, uh, I don't know if that's the correct pronunciation for the current geological age or the first geological age of the Anthropocene. Um, can you please elaborate on this, um, on the concept and its ramifications? Well, first of all, you know, if we're gonna deal with the ecological crisis, which or the planetary emergency, which is the biggest threat that humanity has ever faced, uh, we have to be attentive to the science of it. And, and our, our political movement has to be developed in terms of the science. We can't play play games and, and uh, ignore the science. And the Anthropocene is, uh, is a, a very important concept of the whole um, geological uh, time scale. You know, it hasn't been fully approved, but but um, we're, we're most of the way there. And there's a whole scientific understanding of the Anthropocene, which is how it originated. Incidentally, if you, if you um, that the, the, the notion of the Anthropogene period um, as a, a different name for the quaternary um, and period, um, actually it was developed in in the Soviet Union the Soviet geologists no, used the notion of the Anthropogene and they are uh, they actually used the term Anthropocene in that context too so that if you read you read the um the great Soviet encyclopedia translated into English um though that's in 1971 that's when the word Anthropocene first emerges uh, that's just uh, so people have been thinking about these things for a long time in terms of the science, in terms of the uh, geology. Now, what the Anthropocene means is that for the first time in the entire history of planet, the the uh, main force governing the um, Earth system change, governing 
a geological change or earth system change is, is um, anthropogenic, it's human beings. That's what the Anthropocene means. That for six billion years, non-anthropogenic forces have been uh, the, the um, major forces governing the earth system, non-anthropogenic forces. But around 1950, that switches and anthropogenic forces, that means human beings, you can think of it in terms of anthropogenic climate change, but it goes much beyond that, are now the major force um, on, on um, determining planetary change. Not in a conscious way, you know, but, but um, we are um, the major factor. And that is in a geological sense, in a scientific sense, a major change is it's a, a, a you know it's human beings have been affecting nature for a long time and so we can see a quantitative buildup but the argument is and the it's a very dialectical argument the argument is that in 19 around 1950 and um, we can talk about the markers um, for that the empirical markers but around 1950 there was a qualitative change or a qualitative leap. The, the uh, human uh, impact on the environment uh, rose to the point that um, uh, human beings became the major factor in, in earth system change. And that will never go away. The science says that will never go away as long as we have industrial society. We, want, we will remain the, the um, major um, uh, factor in earth system change, unless um, there is an Anthropocene extinction event, which would mean the extinction of, uh, of human beings or the, the whole destruction of industrial civilization and, and the end of, of, of humanity basically. And um, that certainly is a possibility. So we're in the Anthropocene. Now, the, the, we've been in the Holocene for the last 11,000 years, the Holocene epoch. And that was the period in which civilization developed. And it was very conducive to, to, um, uh, to uh, the whole um, development of human civilization over these thousands of years. But the Anthropocene is, is leading this in the direction of the destruction of human civilization. So, for example, scientists say that if we increase um, uh, global average temperature by four degrees this century, which and we're on track for that, uh, basically, then uh, industrial civilization will not be able to survive. So uh, this, is this is the issue. It's, it's integrated with the entire geological um, and chronographic, chronostratigraphic um, system of, of a geological time scale, which is one of the great achievements of modern science. And the fact that the science has come out and said, look, we have a qualitative change here around 1950, is basically with the the rise of globalized monopoly capital, uh, that um, this is, is significant and is not to be ignored. And we have all of the empirical indicators to show that is the case. Well, then a lot of people in the humanities particularly and who don't necessarily, you know, leftists, but don't necessarily pay any attention to science, um, and, and you know, I mean, the humanities are important too. But we, we have as as Marxists, we have to be interdisciplinary. And uh, a lot of them said, "Well, it's really capitalism, which we'll we'll call it the capitalocene," not um, paying any attention to how these designations are made. They say it was capitalism, the capitalocene, and 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 Jason Moore says, "Well, it started in 1492." which completely, you know, I mean, Columbus was important and colonization is obviously a significant event and, and this is integral to the history of capitalism, that that's different than the question of the 
the uh, transformation in the human relation to the earth system, the qualitative transformation that generated what science calls the Anthropocene. So a lot of people are like smacking capitalism onto the geological label rather than, than focusing on, look, we now have capitalism in the Anthropocene. We know that the capitalist system caused the Anthropocene, but let's not confuse ourselves by, by a misunderstanding what is at issue here. For example, even if capitalism would went away, even if we had socialism at this point, we would still be in the Anthropocene because we are at a point where we can't, um, we can't uh, uh, cease we're not going to cease to be the major factor in in earth system change we have to instead um we have to uh create a more sustainable relation to the earth which is another question so when in the the issue of the capitalinian comes up and actually in in 2020 the spanish geologist or um Carl Soriano uh, came up with a nation, notion of the cap, Capitolian. And the, the Anthropocene is an epic, it's a geological epic, but every geological epic is divided into stages or ages. Well, we'll call them, yeah, they're called both stages and ages, but we'll call them ages. Every geological epic has ages to it. Um, right now we're in the Meghalian age, which is the last age of the Holocene. It started about 4,000 years ago. And um, so what's the first age of the uh, Anthropocene? Nobody had, had answered that. Uh, the geologist um, uh, Carl Soriano, who was also a Marxist, um, and um, engaged in dialectical thought, he um, wrote an article for Geoforum calling the new first age of the uh, Anthropocene uh, the Capitolian, because the first age of the Anthropocene is dominated by capitalism and, and by a crisis that's generated by capitalism. So he called it the Capitolian. Hello. And and um, meanwhile, Brett Clark and I, as environmental sociologists, had arrived at the same conclusion, not aware of of Soriano's analysis. And we wrote an article on the Capitolinian for monthly review that came out in 2000, September 2021 where we we produced exactly the same analysis in great detail and 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 related the capital lien to um, the monopoly capitalism. But our argument was we have to do something that's never been done before in geological um, in the geological um, time clock. Uh, we have to recognize that the capital lien is is uh, represents a period of ecological crisis. Uh, a planetary emergency for the earth itself, and that we can't get beyond the Anthropocene. We will now, we now have responsibility for how we relate to the whole earth system, but we can create a new relation to the earth system if we move in the direction of socialism. And we call the next geological age, the one that has to be created. We're talking about a geological age. And now it's dependent on human history because human history is governing for the first time the, the earth system change. This new um, geological age will have to be the communion named after community, commune and, uh, and, and so on and uh, communal and uh, and it's going to have to be a sustainable, um, it's going to have to represent sustainable human development, a world of ecological sustainability and substantive equality. And it can only be um, um, brought into being by socialist movements or eco-socialist movements. And we have to achieve this. Um, we have to achieve this this century. 
um, hopefully mid-century, we have to move dramatically in that direction. So that's how these concepts fit together. Some people are like uh, carrying the flag, the capitalist scene and ignoring the science. Our approach is to build with the science and create a more powerful critical analysis based on Marxian theory. Yeah, thank you so much. We're actually going to save the questions from the audience to the end, but there was one quick follow-up question on this, namely then what is the beginning date of the Anthropocene for you? Um, maybe you can uh, provide a quick answer to that and we can move on to the next question. Willie, the main empirical indicator of of the Anthropocene that they've come up with is um, the plutonium residu residues, the, the radio um, the nucleides in the environment that are the result of, of um, not really the atomic bombs um, uh, dropped on Hiroshima and, and, and the testing in 1945, but really uh, the thermonuclear testing begin in the early 1950s, the, the detonation of thermonuclear bombs, and you know, primarily by the United States, but also the Soviet Union, France, uh, England. And, um, and this is the main marker of, um, of um, the Anthropocene, and it does represent a dramatic change in the relation of humanity to the earth. So I think that makes sense, but there are other markers around that time. And, uh, but this was, um, this grew out of the second world war and the beginning of the cold war. And from a Marxist perspective, it fits entirely with our understanding of the historical development. Mm. Okay. Um, I mean, Related to these discussions around the Anthropocene is um, the question of agency. Um, and recently, you know, more and more people criticized what they call anthropocentrism and centrism. And um, they suggest uh, to extend the notion of work. So for you, what is work? For example, do animals work? Does the nature work? Do forests work? Or is it something unique to um, humans and human societies? organized around uh, work. Uh, this is, I think, an important question since um, the opponents of anthropocentrism argue that the division between human and non-human natures reproduces the hierarchical narrative of the Anthropocene. And apart from this, but again, in relation to it, um, there is the question of non-production labor or um, reproduction labor, for example, uh, what does the term the working class or working classes comprise for you today? I know like the two are kind of separate questions, but they are also somewhat related. So I wanted to ask them together. Well, the the concept of work is, is um, very complicated. There is the, the word work in the sense of physics means, means just um, is, is closely related to the the term energy, right? It it means um, you know it it and you know matter and motion, but it's very con. Um, it's um, uh, work is um, uh, potential um, force rising from energy, right? Um, and work then, in the sense of physics, work uh, explains the universe. Um, it's it's um, kind of um, the act, you know, energy in action, let's say, and it encompasses everything from from you know the stars to uh, molecules. Everything is is in terms of physics um, is governed by work. So you can use work, the word work, in that sense, um, but um, human work, of course is a more specific category, which we often associated with labor. In English, there were two words, work and labor. In German, there was one, you know, but, um, but um, the, um, the important thing is, um, well, when, when you get to um, these new criticisms of the labor theory of value from 
uh, from uh, environment, left environmental circles. You have a case like Jason Moore, uh, Jason W. Moore in his, uh, his work in, in, in um, Capitalism and the Web of Life and other works. He, he adopted the notion of work and in the sense of physics. And so he says, well, all nature, it works. Um, he didn't really maybe fully uh, think out the implications, but he was, you know, say like a, a river works. And so, um, or, or a bee works. So all of this creates value. And when we take from, from nature, we're, we're taking value produced by the work of rivers and bees and so on. And other people uh, like, um, well, others have um, talked about how animals work or animals labor and so they create value. Now, you know, from a Marxist perspective, all of this is quite confused. From, first of all, you have, you know, for, for Marx, the first thing to understand when you read Marx's Capital is that Marx's Capital is a critique. It's a critique of the capital system or the logic of capital. And so when Marx writes about value, in capital, he's writing about commodity values, the value system of capital, the value form generated by capital. He's not writing about some universal characteristic of the stars and the molecules and so on, or work in, in today's sense of physics. He's, he's talking about how capitalism works and, and um, value is a social form um, that is a product of capitalism. And Marx, when he talks about value, says value is um, due to labor, um, is, is derived from labor. Uh, he's not saying that that's, um, th th he's not saying that in an affirmative sort of way. Well, that is morally correct way to, to view it. He's saying this is how capitalism works. And so he he tells you, let's say in the beginning of Capital and the begin in the beginning of the critique of the Gotha program and other places, that wealth is actually based on both uh, uh, nature and human labor, and that uh, human labor is actually simply a force of is a force of nature, really an emergent force of nature, but both nature and labor com contribute to wealth. And uh, that this this is essential. That um, and wealth is material. We think of it in terms of use values. Well, um, the concept of value in terms of value only labor creates value, but that's not that isn't something that we we need to adhere to as a moral value. Like this is the proper way for it to be, or the appropriate way for it to be, or um, um, Marx is saying this is a contradiction of capitalism. Capitalism uh, is based on, on a system of value that's rooted in, in the exploitation of human labor power. And everything that nature contributes is treated, as he said, as, as he said is, is seen as a, a free gift to capital. Uh, nature is then, as he said, robbed. Ex, um, expropriated, that is taken from without reciprocity. So capitalism is based on, on the exploitation of human labor, um, but it's also based on the expropriation of nature outside of the, the, um, the value nexus itself. So, and, and when it comes to, well, do animals create value? Marx actually con, con, um, commented on that at one point. And uh, I've discussed that, but uh, the the thing is, the value is a social category um, generated by human beings, and it's of course part of of uh, how capitalism, in particular, works. And uh, capitalism treats animals as machines. That's the way it treats them, right? That's how Descartes explained it. That's how 
political economy works. Economics, mainstream economics does not attribute value at all to, to animals. No, no uh, body of economics, no economic theory at all attributes value to animals because that's not the way it works within capitalism. It's true that animals um, are, are um, you know, they're, um, they're expropriated and, and, and robbed in a sense, but, um, but to um, see it as, see them as creating value is to kind of mystify things and to muddy the critique of capitalism itself. The fact that animals are treated um, cruelly abused, something that Marx commented on is a different thing from, from the question of the economic generation of value if we want to look at it in that way. So we, you know, the, um, but the economics is very clear, whether Marxist economics and neoclassical economics is very clear on that. But within bourgeois thought in general, they don't mind muddying the matter um, because um, to, you know, the, the agent of change is not going to be uh, animals. If we, we, um, as, or non-human animals, at least it's not going to be non-human animals. If we change the system, it's going to depend on the action of human beings, and particularly oh, the working class, and um, the um, you know, may, trying to bring in animals into the theory of exploitation does nothing to clarify that problem. I hope. I hope this is is clear. Yeah, it is. It is. Thank you. Um, I mean that. Maybe I can I can slowly move towards questions related um, more to political issues, um, but still re related to theory. Um, what about the role of, for example, imperialism? I know that you approach capitalism as a world system uh, which implies uneven, exploitative and oppressive relations between core capitalist economies and the periphery or the global north and the south. So do you think an environmentalism without an explicit position on imperialism is possible? And what are possible um, practical political implications of this emphasis on imperialism in terms of environmental struggles in the north and the south? Because uh, they take very different trajectories, as we can observe almost on a daily basis. Well, I, I think I think an environmentalism without imperialism is possible, but you know, and capitalist environmentalism or bourgeois environmentalism, so-called, shows us that. But it isn't a con it isn't a coherent environmentalism. It isn't. Um, a systematic ecology, and it can't possibly help us um, um, get out of the ecological crisis, um, which actually is rooted more uh, today in, in imperialism than in anything else. And, um, you know, we have this, we have this vast problem that, um, you know, that we, we're confronting this um, environmental emergency, the planetary environmental emergency in a world that uh, is divided by imperialism. And the, the, um, so far, this has intensified the problem and made it very extremely difficult for us to deal with it. Uh, the imperialism, some, some thinkers like David Harvey and, um, and um, well, I, I and others I couldn't list, but uh, have talked about how imperialism is has reversed, and uh, that um, say the global South is now via China is now beginning to exploit the global global North, and and all of that. I don't um, I don't see it that way at all. I think there's um, you know the we basically have this fundamental division between the global north and the global south and basically between the triad of uh, of of the united states canada europe and and um 
and uh, Japan and the rest of the world um, pretty much is is the way things are now divided up under U.S. hegemony. And of course, this is this is part of the ecological problem. It's also driving us towards uh, a third world war, which could generate um, an ecological disaster as well um, in a totally different way and uh, eliminate humanity. So these are very complex problems. The um, imperialism now, economic imperialism works mainly through the global labor arbitrage, which is um, a process by which um, multinational corporations um, have shifted production to um, those areas of the world where there are the lowest unit labor costs and they're able to, to um, extract huge profits, prof enormous profit margins as a result. And all of this is now expedited by financialization. And now we have the problem that the um, emerging solution to the environmental problem from capitalism is the financialization of nature, which I've written about and which is an imperialist project, which will lead us to absolute disaster in every respect. So these are uh, really complex problems. It's, you know, the, the um, climate change problem is hitting the global south um, more than the global north, although uh, Europe is now the fastest warming continent, but the the global south is particularly hard hit um, because ge um, just in terms of geography, and this is not to get into any kind of ge geographical determinism, but there is an element here. The low latitude countries are are more affected all around by the environmental problem than the the um, countries at the medium and higher latitudes. Uh, uh, and um, so we have all of these divisions. The only solution is really, I mean, the ultimate solution is, is um, and how we get there is, is an issue is we have to have a process of contraction and conversion. That is the rich countries have to um, contract in terms of their use of energy in particular. Not, and then, of course, carbon dioxide has, uh, emissions have to go down to zero by 2050. But we have to, um, but that's not the whole problem. We have to um, contract um, per capita energy use in the global north. And the global south per capita energy use can go up in many places. And what we need is, um, according to all the data, is we need um, to contract and converge and uh, meet somewhere around where um, Italy is today in terms of per capita emissions, which is not not um, so bad. Um, if you've ever been to Italy, I think um, um, it can be a good life. So um, you know the we have. There are real solutions, there, there are paths that we can take, but it's the socioeconomic system of capitalism and, and of course the class system of capitalism, which is the fetter that is preventing us from, from making the really revolutionary changes that, that are necessary at every level. Mm. Um, yes, we, we are receiving many questions from the audience and my friends are helping me to uh, bundle them in a way uh, so that we can ask as many as we can. But uh, some of the questions relate directly um, to, to this question of agency and social change. So, um, you know, the struggle for um, ecological struggle and the labor struggle have confronted each other in many places in a conflictual way and they continue to do so. Uh, Yet still, the enemy uh, of both is the same. It's, it's, it's the capitalist system and the bourgeoisie. Um, and at the same time, we witness that um, those in power are proposing concepts and programs such as the Green New Deal, Just Transition. So here I want to 
you know, put together some of the questions that we received. Uh, one question was, for example, how you evaluate the precautions and measures undertaken at this very moment to prevent global warming. And then another question is how the partnership or, or the cooperation uh, of um, labor and ecology struggles um, could in practice um, be established. Uh, so how, with what kind of demands can the working class lead uh, the ecological struggle? Um, and some are pe some people are speaking of, you know, the labor and capital conflict, the conflict between labor and capital giving way to a conflict between capital and nature as the primary conflict. So um, I believe like most of these questions, although they are formulated in different ways, um, they, they are closely related. So maybe we can take your views on those issues. Well, we, we need to have a general approach to um, the planetary emergency. This is incredibly serious. In monthly review, um, last year, last uh, summer, we came out with an issue on basically um, on, on ecology and, and survivability and uh, recognizing that um, the, the crisis, the catastrophes are now upon us. This is what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC says, we're now really facing these uh, major uh, weather events that um, are hybrid events now with one um, moving, merging rapidly into another, um, you know, with, with um, uh, drought and heat and floods and so on and, and storms and uh, that they're, um, they're um, converging and, you um, uh, we have to deal with these extreme weather events now that are catastrophes that are affecting the world and that are going to increase no matter what we do uh, in terms of, of um, reducing carbon, uh, carbon emissions. Right now we're seeing um, catastrophes. And um, for example, the sea level was going to rise now no matter what we do not only in this century, but in the next century and maybe for a thousand years. The only thing we can do is slow the increase, the rise in sea level, we can't reverse it now. And because, so there are, you know, these problems that we have to cope with. And so we had an issue where we talked about, well, how can the socialist, um, socialist now stop you know, not we still have to talk about stopping climate change and so on, but we also have to talk about organizing in our communities and and um, our societies as a whole to protect the population, right? And what do we need to do that? Um, that and of course it means more collective, more communal uh, structures. But um, in this year's um, month review uh, is coming out in in July in a few days, we've produced our, our um, biggest special issue in our entire history, 172 pages, and it's called uh, Planned Degrowth. Uh, and um, let's, um, uh, Eco-Socialism and Sustainable Human Development is the subtitle. And we, you know, we argue, I mean, planned, Degrowth is a family of theories, and some of them are a little off the mark, and some of them are better. We can't, you know, there's no reason, you know, on a, on principle to be opposed to economic growth, but we are now in a in a place in terms of the science that says that we have to have degrowth in the rich uh, economies, but that doesn't, you know, that that can mean all sorts of things. It means we have to have uh, we have to move to uh, a system of, of no net capital formation, which means really eliminating the capitalists. Um, and um, but um, we can still have qualitative development, redistribution, 
there um, we can um, improve, improve uh, lives for everyone uh, within this context. And but it it's not going to happen on its own. It's not some magical thing, and it's not going to happen. Um, by some act of Congress in the United States, or, um, which is an absurd notion. But we actually have to have, uh, it's not going to happen through the market or some magic of technology. Uh, we have to actually reintroduce economic planning repurposed for the issue of, um, for, for questions of, um, of um, degrowth and and um, contraction and conversion and a sustainable human development, and so um, we brought together people from all over to um, put this together. And um, I wrote an introduction. I go through the whole in whole history of of economic planning in the Soviet Union and elsewhere, and even in the United States in in the Second World War, and how. Um, you know, the, 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 the failures and the successes of planning and how we can, we can actually develop, um, uh, you know, socialist planning to uh, engage the ecological problems and promote qualitative development and redistribution, fulfill human needs and so on. We have to move that way. If you, if you say like degrowth, that you raise, raise that banner, it won't happen without some kind of, of planning. And that requires organization and requires socialists to be behind it. So that's that's one um, answer to the, you know, this complex of questions. In terms of agency, uh, I often talk about the environmental proletariat and um, that sometimes mystifies people, but it doesn't bother me at all. I'm continue to talk about it. Basically, uh, the answer for us lies is rooted in the working class and in workers in general, right? Um, and uh, but we um, we uh, can't uh, see that in in um, really narrow terms. And uh, I think that we're. We have to recognize that we're witnessing, we're in the midst of the biggest changes in all of, of human history uh, right now. We don't know whether it's going to go, wh which way it's going to go, whether humanity is going to be destroyed or whether we're going to find our way out of this. But one thing we do know, that we're in the biggest changes in human history and in the Anthropocene the the force of nature, which is human labor, organized and alienated under capitalism, has created, has uh, disrupted uh, the universal metabolism of nature and the earth system, and we're experiencing what Engels metaphorically called the revenge of nature, and we have to have uh, a response to that, and uh, it's going to change everything, uh, whether we like it or not. The point is, do we enter in and um, and um, in our movements in in the struggle for you know the struggle for socialism? Do we do we um, create an, another path? And I think that in this context of change, new um, social forces will be transformed as well. If you look back to the Engels's condition of the working class, which was arguably the, the first major work um, in Marxian political economy. And, and you know, and it and Engels's outlines had a huge impact on Marx. Uh, the Engels, and Engels always, I mean, Marx always looked back to Engels's uh, work on uh, his conditions. Engels explained the, the working class, not in terms of just factory workers, he explored the conditions of factory workers, but if you read the, the condition of the working class, it is an epidemiological and ecological work. It's mainly about the overall material conditions of the working class. Their, their urban conditions, their housing, their access to water, disease, mortality, 
everything to do with with uh, the living conditions of the working class on every front in and and uh, in which factory work was only a small part. He also looks at mining workers and agricultural workers. But the point is, it's a very broad environmental work. It sees the, the proletariat as, as those who, as Marx said, had been expropriated, but it looks at their whole lives, their whole conditions. We have gradually reduced the working class, our notion of the working class, to a in, notion of an industrial proletariat. That's broken, breaking down in all sorts of ways today, both economically, but also ecologically. And um, we, what do we, um, if we, we apply that broader notion of, of the uh, working class as those who are dispossessed and who are confronting these conditions that affect all, you know, their entire material lives, their material lives are not just economic ones, they're environmental ones. In this day and age, it will become increasingly apparent, and it's especially apparent in the global south now, that there's not that much of, there isn't much of a dividing line between the material conditions that we consider environmental affecting workers and peasants and so on, and the environmental conditions that are e the material conditions that are economic, they're merging together. If you if you have food shortages today, it's just likely to be it's both an ecological and an economic problem at the same time, and everything is melding together in that way. And one way we could you know, and so we're seeing in movements we're seeing coalescence, particularly in the global south. Um, and elsewhere between um, between traditional workers' movements, um, well, or at least the way we've got used to it, and um, the broader environmental proletarian movements that really are, um, are um, key. All revolutions that have taken place on a working class foundation have, have been kind of based on environmental proletariat in the sense that it's always... The revolutions are always based on not just the economic conditions that concern trade unions, but they're also con, um, they're also based on uh, the material conditions and the so social reproduction of labor, um, women's expropriation of women's labor is part of this same logic. So I think we're being pushed in the direction in of a larger environmental proletariat, and people are pushing back against the system and. Um, as an environmental proletariat, and this will become more evident uh, over time. Now, whether whether we win out in this struggle, whether this really coalesces the way it, it, sh it should is another matter. But without this, um, there is really no hope. But, you know, the, uh, the proletariat was created initially, according to Marx, by the expropriation of human beings from the earth, the alienation of labor, the enclosure of the commons and so on. And this has been extended by expropriation all over uh, the world. And um, now we're seeing even more severe forms of expropriation of people from the earth. People are being expropriated from the earth in, in the sense of, of um, losing the the earth as a place of habitation altogether. And this is creating in itself a pressure towards an environmental proletariat, towards a coalescence at the bottom in which the workers will be the core is um, my understanding of it. And uh, so that we once again are faced with the problem of the expropriation of the expropriators. We have to expropriate the expropriators, those who are pushing now the financialization of nature, which will be the, the ultimate um, destruction of the, of the natural basis of our existence. We have to expropriate them in order to create a, um, a habitable planet. And the social, the ecological questions are linked here. We can't have a world of an of uh, ecological sustainability without a world of substantive equality. We can't have a 
a world of substantive equality without ecological sustainability. So we need a system of sustainable human development, which will have to be based on, on, um, on um, plan D growth, confronting the metabolic rift and, and, and an understanding of our place in the planet and our relation to each other. Um, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> the questions keep coming and I'll try to bundle some of them again together. Um, there is a question on, on a paper you published in 2009, the Midas Effect, a critique of climate change economics with Brick Clark and Richard York, where you use the analogy uh, of the Midas Effect to describe current politics and economic order. And the question is, since then, uh, many different environmental policies have been enacted and uh, started to be implemented. So do you think um, there are any successful policies um, that have survived the Midas effect from that date? That's one question. Um, and there is a question, since you mentioned uh, the role of women's labor and um, uh, expropriation and uh, exploitation, uh, there's a question about that. So. Do you ascribe any special position to um, the role of women um, or women's revolution um, in a leading position in the ecological struggle? Um, there's a question on whether or not we should, we could uh, reconsider our, uh, the way we you know, contemplate uh, the transition from capitalism to socialism as a potential path um, to saving our planet. Um, and then there's another question uh, which is um, the monthly review school has become one of the pioneers of ecological Marxism. And um, the question is, can this be put into some sort of practical living organizational structure? I mean, we as Poland Ecology have been uh, thinking over and working towards you know, lasting regional and international alliances, not only, but especially among Marxist ecology organizations and movements. As far as we know, though, there is no you know, international or, uh, you know, there's no network of Marxist ecologists, uh, be it intellectuals or organizations. Um, do you know uh, anything about that? Is there anything that you can advise, recommend, you can share with us? Thank you. Well, uh, in terms of um, the Midas effect, which is really about the, the domination of, of um, capitalist capitalism and neoclassical economics over ecological strategy i don't i don't think there has been there have been um any successes um let us genuine ecological su successes uh coming from the system unfortunately i mean the if you read the the midas effect you would say it um was focusing on on um, Nordhaus uh, Nordhaus's work, and um, I, I think it was after that that he was given uh, the Nobel Prize in Economics for his contribution to ecology. But but his his main his main argument was that you know if we if uh, global average temperature, this is what he argued, went up to six degrees by the end of the century, it would result in a 1% reduction in world economic growth. And of course, the scientists said, well, economists may, may think that, but we'd all be dead. And the economists replied, you don't know anything about the economy. And uh, the scientists replied, you don't know anything about life. But Nordhaus got uh, the Nobel Prize in economics for his, his, um, his contributions to ecology uh, when he theorized a policy of not doing anything, of like a slow ramp up effect. Um, and that's what he got the prize for, um, for holding back um, um, the, um, the necessary uh, changes. And, you know, if you look at the Inflation Reduction Act that was just published by the United States, which is the first 
ecological um, uh, act of the U.S. Congress on on climate change. The whole thing is completely fraudulent, and will do nothing. I've written about the details, but um, to sum it up, it it um, it's um, completely smoke and mirrors. And uh, so, um, yeah, we have. And what is the main initiative? And this is something I've written that's going on globally. That's coming out of out of um, the actually coming out of um, the um, COP meetings out of um, of World Bank and so on, and it's the financialization of nature, um, chain, you know, taking um, carbon trading and all of that, and and um, and and uh, actually uh, converting ecosystem services into a economic category. So that they can they can manage on an economic basis the entire natural world, um, buying it up and controlling it, and uh, this is no joke. It's I've written on this. You can just look up the financialization of nature in month review. You can read my new book that's coming out, which will have uh, um, chapters on that, and uh, this is. Um, this is very, very dangerous. So the system is offering no alternatives. You know, we've known about this since the mid 1960s in terms of climate change, and we've effectively done nothing. I mean, most of uh, you know the things that um, they say it's it's been um, very little, and we're we're continuing to increase carbon emissions, and. Um, the um, we will the only way, according to IPCC, that is um, that we can avoid a 1.5 degrees increase in global average temperature is to even in the most optimistic scenario is to not um, cross that threshold until 2040, and then it, we will go up um, a couple of um, tenths of degrees and then come down again by the end of the century. That's the most optimistic scenario. But the um, World uh, Meteorological Organization has just said that we're going to, to uh, cross the 1.5 degrees uh, boundary in the next, I believe it is seven years. And so uh, we're really up against the wall and this system is not doing anything. So um, the answer, I mean, we're inside capitalism, right? We don't have, we don't, um, for the most part, I mean, there are aspects of socialism in various parts of the world, but we're basically inside this system and we have to make the changes. We have to change, make the changes obviously within in a revolutionary way. That is by going against the logic of capital. Um, I don't even talk about non-reformist reforms because that's become so um, watered down and and um, absurd in some points. But we have to take, you know, our struggles are a movement towards socialism, which means going against the logic of capitalism within the system for in order to um, create the necessary structures and to, in order to transcend the system. And we need some kind of planned uh, degrowth. But remember, this is a socialist approach to degrowth. It's not making degrowth into a principle, but just simply dealing with the necessities and putting uh, human, human beings and human sustainability and human development at the core. So um, we need those approaches. I don't think that um, labor is inherently aligned with capital against the earth. I've already addressed that in terms of the, um, the um, in environmental proletariat. I think that we're seeing quite a different trajectory that is actually scaring those uh, in, in power. Uh, I, I, in terms of cap going from capitalism to socialism to the planet, it, um, to, to dealing with the planetary problem, we have to, um, we can't wait for a, 
a socialist revolution in Europe and the United States in that sense, like um, a storming of, uh, of um, the Winter Palace or around, something like that. Um, what we have to do is struggle right now um, and the the movement is the revolutionary movement is a movement against the logic of capital, and we can carry on that now from where we are at. And the more that we uh, succeed uh, to to push the system against itself, which is what is necessary for human survival, the more we will create a basis for transcending um, this uh, alienated social system itself. So um, I guess that's basically how I see it. I hope I've answered all the questions. In terms of social reproduction and uh, women, I think social reproduction theory is crucial in this. I think that the there are various thinkers. Um, uh, I have, you know, Marx's, we'll go back to Marx's notion of primitive accumulation, so-called primitive accumulation. Marx rejected the the concept of primitive accumulation, which was introduced by bourgeois economists, particularly uh, Adam Smith, he didn't. He um, ridiculed it, called it, you know, kind of a, an infantile notion. The whole notion of primitive accumulation. He called it so-called primitive accumulation. And uh, what he said is the pro the appropriate term. And he explained this in in wage, labor, and capital, or value, price, and profit, I forget which, because I, I my, my copy has them both together. But he, he, called, he said the, the real term is original expropriation. And it's the original expropriation of the working class that generated capitalism. And that expropriation is, is the external basis for the system and it's the basis in which its inner core of exploitation occurs. And capitalism not only carried out an inter, um, original expropriation of, say, um, the commons, but it has to continue that uh, expropriation all the time and on its external, um, as its external basis, that manifests in imperialism, the expropriation of the whole earth. And uh, it's also manifested in the expropriation of women's labor. Now, why this is important is Marx didn't use the term primitive accumulation. The term primitive was a mistranslation anyway, but the accumulation issue is the important one. It was an accumulation um, when, when they took the, the, over the commons, when they seized the commons, that wasn't accumulation, that was robbery. Um, accumulation is based on the exploitation of labor and in the production process based on equal exchange, which conceals um, uh, the, the harsh nature of exploitation. But, but expropriation is straight out robbery, right? And uh, they expropriated the commons. And what do we do? What what's um, women's labor isn't exploited in the sense it isn't integrated into the value structure it's expropriated. They're, the use values they produce in the household are expropriated, just like subsistence labor is um, expropriated by capital. So they're robbed. And, and Marx said women are slaves in the household in which uh, men um, who are so-called heads of the household play a part. And uh, that has to be broken down. And we have to understand that the basis of production is really social reproduction. Reproduction is really what it's all about. We have to um, we have to break down the expropriation of women's labor. So, in theorists like um, various theorists well, working um, with social reproduction theory, like Nancy Fraser, have adopted the concept of expropriation to explain the basis of of um, of uh, you know alienated social reproduction of of women, the um, before that we adopted the concept of expropriation to explain capitalism's relation to the earth. It's um, it's it's expropriating the earth as a free gift to capital, without reciprocity, and that was so fundamental to Marx's theory. So we call this the problem of the robbery and the rift. 
and in in terms of um, of um, of race theory, in terms of 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 the the um, the theory of racial capitalism, figures like Michael Dawson at the University of Chicago have used the concept of expropriation to explain um, slavery and uh, and uh, how race relations work under capitalism, and um, we also use this to understand imperialism. So there's a general movement in Marxist theory to bring together the analysis of exploitation and expropriation in, in a synthesis that encompasses the ecological problem, social reproduction theory, imperialism theory, the theory of racial capitalism, and so on. And we've been trying to develop that in month review. Well, uh, this was a uh, lot for us to digest. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Um, I mean, we keep having questions coming, but I think uh, we can stop at this point <laughs> without exhausting you even more. Um, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, it, was, it was an honor for us to host you. Um, and we wish you the best. And if you happen to visit Turkey one day, Maybe our comrades there can meet you in person. That would be amazing. Thank you for so much. Yeah, thank you. It's an honor for me too. And I would like to return to Turkey someday. Um, although right now it's it's pretty much impossible because of family conditions, but um, I'm hoping I will be able to in the future. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day. You too.